being new camp for let's see, there we go. Okay, second system effect. <clears throat> Mythical name of chapter five. Uh, Frank Brooks says that the second version of a system is the most dangerous version an engineer ever builds. Because her or his inclination will be to put in everything that got left out of the first version, plus anything else she or he can think of. Uh, and the problem here is that the, what you really want is to be doing an incremental development process. In other words, you want shorter term releases. I, as, as you know, I do a lot of reviews of fail or failing projects, and inevitably one of the consistent patterns is the Big Bang effect, which is here are the 300 features we want in. We have to have all 300 of them in there. We're going to work on this for three or four years, and then we're going to release it, and it's all just going to be wonderful. Uh, the problem is when you do that is first, you do at some point either keep slipping the schedule or start throwing up features. And second, when you finally release it, the customer says, I hate this. That's not what I want to know. You say, but it, it's on the sheet that you signed off on, and the customer says, I don't care. I, I hate this. I've seen it on the screen now. I've had that experience personally. I think I've mentioned here that in the Sundog there was some particular feature of the game that I thought was a great idea, and I spent about three weeks coding it, and when I finally got it up working on the screen, I looked at it for about two minutes and said no. Basically threw away three weeks of work. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, that, that happens. Uh, you know, I, as, as it says in my reckon, uh, I hate it, it's feedback. Uh, it's not feedback you want to hear, but it's, it's often very powerful feedback. So, the big challenge here, oh, I do have a pointer. I don't have to just gesture well at the screen. This is a challenge. Features that may seem simple to the customer may actually be very difficult to design and implement. How many of you have had this experience? <laughs> Tell us about some of your experiences with this. Where the customer, you know, wherever you're doing sign for says, can you just add this? And it's like, no, it's so hard. It's, and they're like, why? You did this and this. Come on, I want to hear some personal experiences. Yeah. So when I worked for Microfocus, um, we sold off a beast on Zeus. Uh -huh. We sold it off. And we were sharing an app called Mozilla, and they wanted to hide their issues from our issues. And it turns out, because of the way Bugzilla is built, that to do that would be massive. Just, just massive. And so we ended up deciding that we were going to build two separate Bugzilla instances because it was going to be way faster and way cheaper than trying to split out what we had already put, built together. Yep. What else? Who else wants to guess? Thank you. It's kind of a, a more general example, but the CEO is, it, of my company was always like famous for going and saying, "Yeah, can we add this? You know, it's, it's just a button." And the chief architect was like, "How in the world are we supposed to do that? It's just a button." And so, like now, every time, like he said, he's like, "Cure cancer. It's just a button." Like yeah, yeah like it's just like <laughs> simple, a simple matter of programming. Right. So it's just the uh, okay, other let's come on. I saw a lot of hands come up. What are some of your other examples where you've had this happen? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Um, we're working on a new progress to the degree page for the university website. And one of the things they wanted to add was like how many hours of, of this requirement are pending. And that was my job to implement it. And I recently fixed it. It sounded really easy though, but it actually ended up requiring a lot of a lot of new code and a lot of factor. Yeah, it, it's what happens. And here's what makes it so difficult. How many of you had the opposite experience? Where someone asks for a feature, and you say, oh yeah, and you code for like 30 minutes, and bam, it's there and it's work. How many of you have had that experience? Okay, try to avoid doing that. <laughs> Seriously, because they will think that you can do that every time, and with every feature. Uh, and, and you know what a rush it is. I mean, you've done that, where it's, it's kind of like, oh wait, this is so cool, I can do this, and you crank some code and you do this and you pull, pull this in here and you call this routine over there and bam, you just, you just added this nifty new feature 
in you know, a matter of hours, if not just minutes. And you think you can do that. One of the projects I had to go review was uh, a new customer-facing website being rolled out in a big, big financial company. And the development team, by sheer luck and force of effort, actually delivered the 1.0 version of the website on time. And you know what management did? They said, do it again. Here's all these new features. Uh, we want you to add all these, and we want you to do it in the same time frame. Uh, and the development team basically said, no, no, you don't understand. This is, this is one enormous kludge. It is all bailing wire and chewing gum. We have to go back and fix technical debt. Uh, and OSG got brought in. I was, I was leading the team doing the review. And our recommendation was back off. Let them go through and fix the stuff they need to fix. Let them do the 1.1 release, not a 2.0 release. And to their credit, they actually did that. And were successful with it. Now, second system effect. It's, it's this iterative development. Brooks, Brooks brought this up back before iterative development was really much of a thing. So he says, this is it's the, the, the second version is always the most dangerous. He says, iterative development helps us go away. But you still have the strong temptation of throwing in everything but the kitchen sink into the next version and incurring technical debt. Now, technical debt, if that's a term I assume most of you are probably familiar with it, technical debt is all the shortcuts you took in getting to your next release. All the, all the quick and dirty stuff, all the stuff that's just patched together, all the stuff that really, really needs to be fixed, and you gritted your teeth and you live with it just to get to the release. <clears throat> a lot of organizations are very bad at fixing technical debt. Uh, and I mean, if, if I have my daughter Crystal come in and talk this semester, she may talk about this one of her first projects. She and a small team were to stand up this new application with her company. And it was, it, was, it was sort of like two steps beyond being a prototype. I mean, they were actually using it for real world stuff. But to get it done in the time frame, they were using like Microsoft SQL Server. And we're, we're every step of the way saying, this is quick and dirty. This is a proof of concept and so on. And when they delivered, the company came back and said, OK, we now need to exp expand the user base by a factor of 100. <laughs> and she's like, no. <laughs> No, it can't work. And, and fought a battle for a couple months, uh, saying, no, this, this won't work. This, is, this was, you know, we, we built this. We told you this was, you know, a limited release prototype. It cannot support that customer base. It will die and choke horribly. And uh, finally got them to, to go along and to understand that and let them do it right. How many of you have had issues with te technical debt at companies? Oh, whatever your question is or issue. How do you think, do you have like a suggestion for mitigating that? Um, <coughs> is it uh, prudent to have like, to, I think kind of the DevOps idea is you embed the development people and operations people on the same team. Does it make sense to, to do the same kind of thing with business people, um, with management? Here's the, the the short answer is yes, it does make sense. The longer answer is business people, for the most part, aren't interested and don't understand. Uh, and so what you need to do, one of the biggest things that I have discovered as an expert witness, I have to explain complex technical issues to judges and juries. Uh, and so what I am forever doing, what I always start doing, is what are analogies that they will understand? This is what you have to do with the business people in your organizations or upper management who are trying to tell you things. You have to come up with the right analogies and say, you know, you're trying to build a castle on the foundation of an outhouse. We need to go back and redig out the foundation and make sure it is steady enough to support the stress and load we want to put in there. Uh, how many of you have followed the debacle with the uh, 
the uh, shadow app in, in the Iowa caucuses. Uh, oh, I've been, I've been all over that. From what I can tell, from what I've read, haven't had a chance to examine it correctly, someone took a React tutorial <laughs> and put something together. They did not go through Google Play or App Store certification, but were using a test deployment that's used just for testing apps to push it out there. Basically, it had no quality assurance, had no security. Uh, someone's like, yeah, let's, you know, get a group together and put a show on in the bar. Uh, that was pretty much the level of, of software. And what was, what was even more fascinating and somewhat hilarious for me is that on a smaller scale, it very much parallel a great IT disaster that happened with the Romney campaign in 2012, where they had a get out the vote software called Orca. I did a full, I was an Orca volunteer, I was actually a poll washer. And what I was supposed to do is, you know, hourly log all the voting at the polling station and then go report it through a website. <coughs> I could not log in most of the day. No one had done any stress testing. The whole thing had been developed in six months. There had never been any deployment of it before election day. Oh my gosh. So it's, it's a big, big deployment on election day. And of course, it all melted down. Uh, the, uh, my understanding is that the, with the Nevada caucuses coming up, if you do some searching there, they're trying to do something that's, that's simpler. It's, they're not using the shadow app, but they're trying to do something with iPads and reporting via iPads. And if you go do some Googling and search articles, you'll see some of the volunteers saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to use this iPad. Uh, now, I will note for the record, there's been a big push for the last 20 years towards electronic voting. Almost all of it stems from the controversies in Florida in the presidential election of 2020 with what was called hanging Chad on physical ballots. And everyone's like, this is primitive. We should be doing all electronic voting. And I can tell you that virtually every person I know in IT, including myself, said no. Electronic voting is a really bad idea. There's a great XKCD uh, cartoon that you can look up on it. Uh, it's like, no, no, you don't want this. You don't want this. And we've been saying it for 20 years. Uh, and actually, ironically, some, some, people, some states and organizations going back and saying, gee, maybe we should use paper ballots. Says, yes, you should. Paper ballots have been used for hundreds of years. We know how to make it relatively foolproof. Electronics voting is just a disaster. Okay, any other questions, comments, observations here before we move on? Yeah? Right, would electronic voting be bad for some people can like, uh, take over one of the identities? Oh, they can do all sorts of things. Like, you know, they're, they could, once, once, if it's electronic, if you have no paper trail, they can do whatever they want to it. Uh, yes? This is kind of an answer to that. Another plan of reasoning is closed source. Oh, yeah. Voting code that has people freaked out as well. Yep, closed source voting code, which means you don't know what it's doing behind the scenes. <laughs> it's a bit like, there's an interesting controversy <clears throat> uh, that's been going on for several years now in breathalyzer software. Uh, because there have been challenges as to whether or not the actual software running the breathalyzer uh, is accurate and consistent in how it works, and the company that makes it has refused to provide the source. This has been a legal battle going on for several years. But, you know, if, well, I have <clears throat> my meme that says there is no true, uh, true AI, it's just some coder's algorithms with bugs. Okay, that's true with voting software. That's true with, you know, breathalyzer software. Stop and think of the level of defects in software that you personally have worked on. And then try to decide if you want a felony conviction based on whether or not that software is actually accurate. Okay. Yes? So does that mean you'd be like very against like self-driving cars? Because I feel like voting I am very against self-driving cars. Well, actually, it's, it's not that I'm against self-driving cars. I am profoundly skeptical yeah. Of, of true autonomous cars. I actually think it's, it's much like the whole field of AI. There are specific tasks that cars can do that they can do very well. Uh, I've driven rental cars that 
will keep me in my lane and will adjust my uh, uh, cruise control based on the car in front of me. That's a useful aid. But I'll tell you, as a driver, when I pull into a residential neighborhood with small children, I slow down to like 15 miles an hour and I am furiously scanning in all directions. My wife and I raised nine kids. I, it, it, there's nothing to me more terrifying than the thought of hitting a small child with a car. And I have, I have profound skepticism as to truly autonomous cars operating within an environment that has human-driven cars, people on bicycles, pedestrians, small children, and pets. Uh, I, I have seen nothing that makes me think that they can operate effectively outside of a very limited and constrained environment. Yeah. Frankly, if, if, if we get to true autonomous cars where I first expect to see it, it's someplace like New York City. I can see New York City simply banning human-driven cars uh, or s severely limiting them and saying everything has to be autonomous. Because you, literally you're surrounded by the river and bridges and you can screen everything and half the people in New York don't drive anyway. I, I had a friend of mine who lived in New York until he was in his late 50s and never got a driver's license until he moved to Texas. Uh, so, any other comments or questions? Here? <clears throat> okay, plan to throw one away. Now, Brooks. Again, Brooks wrote this back before iterative development. Uh, and his, his basic intention is you really don't know what you're trying to develop until you get half to three fourths of the way through what you're doing. And sometimes it is a far better choice to simply throw it away and start over from scratch than to, uh, you're, you're not ignoring what you've learned, but you're saying we're going to rebuild this and rebuild it cleanly. One of the things I am proudest of uh, at Pages. I was prototyping the user interface, you know, with, with some limited functionality. This is what we'd show to investors uh, and show to the engineers when we brought them in. And when we closed on our venture funding, I took the source code for that prototype and I deleted it completely. Oh my God. And we had to start building the whole thing from scratch again. Now we had. <coughs> We had demos, we knew what the user interface was going to look like. We were using interface build. This is Objective-C. This is sort of Mac OS X before Mac OS X was under next step. Uh, and I already had the architecture laid out and everything else, but I did not want a single line of that prototype code, which was awful. It was awful. It was so kludgy. Simply to make things work to show off to investors. Uh, and I knew if I did not do that, it would it would make its way into the, the product and cause problems. So, but the problem here is that far too often pilot or prototype systems are forced into development. Uh, the <clears throat> we're back to what I said a week or two ago where I, you know, I want the quarter scale PC to show the prototype so that you know, management doesn't say, oh well, when can we ship? It looks like it's all done. It's like, <laughs> it's all just a facade. It's like a, Hollywood facade for the old western town where you just see the, the front of the building and it's just got boards behind it standing up. That's a lot of what we code when we're, when we're doing proof of concept, particularly UI and getting feedback from the customer and they think they can actually walk in and buy goods at the dry goods store. Uh, any of you have been through this experience where uh, you really think the code you're working on should have been thrown away and started over again, as opposed to continuing to try and make it work. Anyone want to, anyone want to share things? Yes. Uh, I might have shared this before. That's okay. I, I repeat myself all the time. I, uh, <laughs> I hired to work on a project, and it was, should we, re, should we start over and just build new code, or should we modify what we had? I opened up the existing code. There was a file with uh, 10,000 lines in it with database um, accessors, so SQL code, JavaScript includes, it had everything in one file. It was, it was horrifying. So I took one look at it and decided we're starting over. Yeah, we're starting over. Keep this in mind, because a lot of you, for your entry jobs, may find yourselves maintaining existing code or being put on projects that started out as prototypes. 
Uh, any other questions? Observations on this issue? <coughs> okay. <clears throat> A couple of things he also talks about this. First is plan the organizational for change. Plan the organization for change. And tends, Brooks tends to lump in several ideas under sort of one topic. Uh, so the title of the chapter doesn't always match everything he's covering. <coughs> Here is a big issue that has been there the whole time we've been in IT, which is there is no technical track beyond a certain level. In other words, you're, you're like a developer, you're a senior developer, a senior software engineer. If you're lucky, they may promote you to architect. Uh, the, the alpha nerd is chief technical officer. But for the rest of you, you get put into the management. Whether or not you like it, whether or not you're any good at it. Uh, this is particularly true in large organizations, if you're working in corporate IT, if you're working in government IT. They suddenly want to make you a manager. Uh, and I'm not talking just about team leader. It's kind of like, well, you're in management now. You're never going to touch anything technical again. It's useful to have managers that do, in fact, understand the technology. But what happens here is you lose your best technical people. They go off and they become consultants or contract coders, because they continue to do, or they go to a startup. Because they can they continue to do cool technical stuff, which their company wasn't allowing them to. Now, there are companies that avoid this, where you have either an explicit technical track, or you have a generic title, like member of technical staff. Uh, that's famously what you had at Bell Labs, back when Bell Labs was something good. Uh, and so, this is something to keep to be aware of as you hire uh, or as you are hired into jobs to see what's your long-term path. I mean, the classic interview question that you get is, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, and the question there is, well, I don't know, what titles do you have for me? What can I work towards? Where can I be in five years? What can I be doing? What am I going to be held? What? Phrase a little nicer than that. Uh, the, another thing he discusses in this chapter is on software maintenance. Now, this is an interesting thing. This is out of Robert Glass's uh, Facts and Fallacy. About 60% of work on existing systems is adding new features. And about 40, 30 to 40% is bug fixes. So, what you have, though, is that usually this is often. For those of you with entry level positions, this may be what you end up doing. You're given an existing system. Here's a set of features that we need added. Here's some bugs we need fixed. And as soon as you have done that, you get promoted, then you start working on new stuff, and the next entry level person comes. So what you have is a circumstance where the code rots over time. Because usually what you're trying to do is you're trying to just get the stuff done and get it working. You're not cleaning it up, you're not refactoring, uh, you're not re-architecting, usually. And the, the systems become less stable and less reliable over time, and they become more fragile. It's like I have to add this feature in, and I've had five of the programmers before me make random changes to the software, and if I change this, something breaks here. If I change this, something breaks here. Uh, and so this is a challenge that you're going to face if you find yourself maintaining existing software. Uh, and then, as time goes on, you usually are not fixing the original design flaws. In other words, there may be some fundamental problems with the architecture, design, implementation. And sometimes you don't have the luxury of saying, we're throwing this out. You have to fix what's there, and so the, the software becomes even less stable and less reliable. Any observations, experiences with this? Any horror stories anyone wants to share? Everyone's like, did I choose the right career? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grin and bear it, get through it, get promoted, find a new job. Yes? If you do have software that's like a kiosk, like any code that's maybe not architected great, and you need to add features to it. Um, but you're not allowed to throw the whole thing away. 
what's the time? Um, like, if you want to be able to slow, like, piecemeal or redesign it so that it starts to look prettier, what's the time cost? Is it higher than throwing away and starting again? No, it actually it may <coughs> well be shorter. So the best thing there to do is keep your mouth shut and quietly rewrite the thing. Uh, I told you about my experience at Apple with this, this one routine that was like 17 pages of Pascal that was filled with go-to statements. I didn't tell them I was rewriting the whole thing. It was just clear to me that it was the only way I was going to actually be able to add the features and fix the bugs. And I thought, well, I'll try this out. And analyzed it and wrote, replaced it with like two and a half pages of Pascal. Did all the same stuff, did it better. Fixed the bugs in the process and started adding features. And they were all, oh, this is great. And I never told them, like, yeah, well, I threw out 15 pages of worthless code. Uh, or actually 17 pages of worthless code. Yes? I'm working on a project right now that um, I had to add a feature, or actually I had to switch a technology. Anyways, okay. And I had a lack of understanding of the code I was looking at. And to me, it looked overly complicated and a mess because of my lack of understanding. Yeah. And so I began to rewrite it, and a more educated individual caught me in the act, reversed it, and it, came, it became as simple as changing like two or three lines in the existing code. And so how do you detect whether you're just <laughs> lacking understanding or looking at code? Yeah, welcome, welcome to the real world. Uh, that, that, is, that is a classic issue. In other words, the code may be carefully structured according to technologies, practices, design patterns, whatever, that you don't particularly understand. And you actually hit upon the answer there, which is if there's someone there who is, whose opinion, technical opinion you trust appears to be more qualified and more uh, familiar with it, sit down with her or him and say, okay, explain to me why this is written this way. And if they, if they look at it and say, well, this is why, and this is what you do, and you know, if you've got to do this, this is what you're going to change, then you have an experience like yours. Uh, otherwise, the experience may be a bit like I took, uh, uh, I took a graduate class in pattern recognition, which is really advanced applied statistics and calculus. Uh, and I consider myself relatively bright, but there was this, this homework problem the professor assigned. And I beat my head on for like three hours and thought, I'm getting nowhere. I just don't see how to do this. So I, find, I went into his office and you know, said, you know, I'm trying to work this, this homework program. Uh, can you help me with this? He said, oh yeah, this is simple. And stuck the chalkboard and you know, started looking at the program and writing stuff. 30 minutes later, he was staring at the chalkboard going, huh. And he can solve it. <laughs> he said, I guess I need to, to come up with a different problem for the class. Uh, I, I felt much gratified there. It's like, okay, I'm not totally clueless there. The, uh, the professor can't, can't solve the problem either. So, so if you take it to someone, you know, more experienced inside there, more technical stuff, and they look at it and say, oh, that's a mess. Uh, then what you do is ask something like, well, what's sort of the minimum we can do to make this change, implement this feature, fix this bug, without messing <clears> stuff up, or do you think we should actually start rewriting portions of it? But yeah, it's hard. This is, guys, you're you're in a you're in a tough tough profession. <laughs> it's it's you know armor armor will come back to haunt you for the next forty years. Uh, there is going to be ignorance and invention that you're going to have to struggle with all through your professional career. Yeah. So the piggyback off of that comment, but like the reverse. So I uh, there's a previous individual who was working on this code base. Uh, had implemented some features, we'll call it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> scary quotes. <laughs> had, uh, anyway, re ended up refactoring a lot of the code base to their way. Um, technical leaders thought that was really bad, but couldn't revert it without losing uh, one's worth of features. Um, so then I was trying to figure out how do we refactor this, but then I started thinking, wow, it's actually like, these features like actually make sense uh, from a strange mm -hmm. in a strange way and like how do you beat that right? You just do what your boss tells you to do anyway, or yeah, this is this is this is where it's, it's sometimes helpful to sort of <laughs> kick it up a level or two and say this is what I'm finding. What would you like me to do? Uh, pick your battles. <laughs> 
you know, decide, decide what battles you want to fight and what battles you're like, I'm willing to live with this. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's going to be messy. You're going to have, you know, again, this is a highly creative, highly inventive profession. You're going to have people with different approaches. You're going to have people with different levels of skill, understanding, experience, talent. And sometimes it's hard to tell what's, uh, what's genius, what's simply a different approach, uh, and what's just a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, and, and sometimes they're sort of all three. Any other questions here? Yes? Sorry, I didn't ask a lot. No, um, that's, that's why it's not fun. I was thinking about the lack of technical track. Uh -huh. And one of my, the first question I had was, well, do managers get paid more than developers? And then if so, what if you reverse that? Well, if you pay to get developers to stay longer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no. Quite often, if you have someone who's purely a manager, often the developers who are working for them will get paid more. It uh, tends to create a lot of resentment on the part of the managers, quite frankly. Uh, but you keep your good developers. And developer salaries are, are all over the place. I was startled. Uh, I did a case several years ago that had to do with day trading, high-speed algorithmic day trading. And it was a big trade secret case between a company that had split in half, and you had people we used to work together, now <coughs> suing each other, and hammer suing. Uh, and one of the things I discovered is the programmers they had working for them were making over a million dollars a year of software engineers. Because that's how valuable these companies considered these trading algorithms to be. And the, the developers understood the market and were writing these things. Now, what was really ironic in that is that the big, the big conflict was that you know these day, these algorithms gave them advantages in the marketplace. And so we had experts on both sides doing market analysis to see how much use of a particular algorithm on a particular day influenced the return on trade for that day. You know what they discovered? It didn't influence it at all. The, the, the dominant influence was simply how the market was doing that day. And it didn't matter which algorithm was being used. At which point the whole case settled and went away. <laughs> because there were no damages that either side could claim against the other for, for using the, the algorithms that both were hitting on. And <clears throat> the advantage of the trading wasn't the particular intelligent algorithm, it was simply the speed at which you could trade. Uh, okay. Uh, quality, if time permits. Oh my gosh, I'm going to talk about quality later too. Uh, I don't know what to say here other than our, our industry is awful when it comes to software quality assurance. It's always short changed. I mean, there are organizations that actually do an excellent job of quality. A lot of DevOps, the idea is to shorten the development cycle and automate the testing to such an extent that you improve the overall quality of it. Studies have shown that the more that is invested in quality, the better the return. But it's so hard to convince management of that. And frankly, it's often hard to convince developers of that. Uh, the, you know, as, as Brooks said, we spend 50% of our time in effect tests finding and fixing bugs, even though we haven't planned for that. And this is why so many projects are so late. They get to where they think they're ready to go live, and they just have this never-ending stream of defects. And they either never ship, or you know, they, they, they're delayed in shipping, or they push out a buggy product. We've all been there. Uh, What have been some of your observations as far as organizations that you've been involved with that have pushed out bad software? Anyone have anything you want to volunteer? Buggy software, yeah. Seems like a lot of that happens when the management doesn't understand the technical side. Oh yeah. Like, nobody's actually in charge of it. They don't know how to do it. The I I I think I've already mentioned that uh, if I haven't, I'm mentioning it now. 
I was called in, led a team to review a uh, project at a major financial firm that had gone on for four years, spent half a billion dollars, had nothing in production. And the first two questions, literally the first two questions I asked was, were, who's the chief architect? There was none. Who's in charge of software quality assurance? There was nobody. They were doing ad hoc software quality assurance. Oh, their answer was literally to the extent of, well, you know, when we think we're ready to test, we just get a group together and have them do some testing. It's a half billion dollar project. There's a reason why they had no code that could go into production. Uh, and our analysis was all on quality assurance and testing, and we're going back to a lot of stuff and saying, there are whole subsystems here that probably need to be rewritten from scratch. They did not like to hear that answer. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 you know, me and Larry, and Larry saying, can't we just hire some college students to sort of bang on the word processor for a few weeks and test it that way? It's like, no, that's, Larry, that's not how that works. Uh, quality assurance is, is much more than that, and companies that focus on quality, that invest in it, that pay attention to it, do very well. And you get software that just works. Uh, companies that don't release products that are buggy on release and continue to be buggy through multiple releases and re-releases and dot releases. Any other observations or feedback here? Okay, Laetra, this is, <clears throat> later on we're going to read uh, No Silver Bullet, Essence and Accidents in Software Engineering by Fred Brooks, which is probably one of the single most important essays ever written in software engineering literature. But, the uh, DeMarco Lister addressed many of the same issues with the false hopes of software management. <clears throat> These have been around for decades, literally. Uh, there's some new trick that can send productivity soaring. Other managers are getting gains of 100 to 200 percent productivity or more. Technology is moving so swiftly you have to grab to it or you're going to be passed by. Changing a language or methodology will give you huge gains. Uh, you need to double your productivity. You know, work faster. Uh, the uh, can you automate away your developers? AI is going to replace software engineers. I laugh every time. Hearing that for 40 years. Uh, if anything, it's, it's less likely now. Uh, and your people will work better if you put them under a lot of pressure. <laughs> you know, the, uh, we want you in here at 8 each morning and we need to work weekends. Uh, how many of you have, been, have encountered any of these places you've worked? Anyone? Yes? It wasn't, a, it wasn't really a, a developer. Product, you know, okay. You know, but it's the same kind of thing. And after a couple of years, I just I completely burned out to the point where you know they ended up with a bunch of unfinished products and just got them so done. Yep. The this, these, these, all these concepts are still around. They're still running. Right into Smart organizations know better, but <clears throat> you'll still have all this. I wrote uh, back after after five years at Pages wrote the book Pitfalls of Object-Oriented Development. It came out in 1995. And the first three chapters from that book are what you're going to read as Webster 7, except in place of object-oriented development, I simply say technology or methodology. Because all the same concepts apply to whatever technology or methodology. New language, you know, whether it's DevOps, whether it's Agile, whether it's you know, Swift, functional programming, all the great saviors of software are not saviors at all. Stop and think there is a vast amount of civil, human civilization that runs on COBOL <laughs> and Fortran and C. Uh, because they can implement uh, You know, there, there are no magic technologies. There are certainly gains that you can get, but there are no magic technologies. There's no magic concepts. <coughs> and you cannot force people to invent faster, <laughs> or to solve problems faster. It just doesn't work. Been there, done that. Any, any other observations, feedbacks, questions? I hope I'm not discouraging you here. Yes? So, 
if you have a, let's say that, I guess I'll just tell you what I'm doing. So I'm on this team, we're doing a Mars rover, and there's a team that's doing, not a real Mars rover, it's a competition. Yeah. A six-wheel rover in a competition. Um, and it has a robotic arm. I'm in charge of the electronics. There's another guy in charge of the arm team, right? Um, I have to put a lot of pressure on him to get the arm done by the competition. And I, there's this, this developing tension between him and I. Because I'm constantly like, hey, how's the arm going? Is that thing done yet? How's it going? You know we have like three months left and you don't have an arm yet. Right? Like, <coughs> what's a healthy way to push people that are moving slower than they should? Do this or I'll fire you. Uh, no, no, actually, you, that's actually a very good point. And the pressure here is the sort of, it's what uh, Ed Jordan, and he's got a book on the whole subject called Death March, uh, in the second edition. You have death, programming death marches, where it's, we're all going to work, you know, 80 hours a week for the next six months to get this project out. That's something different. If it's someone who is not meeting their duties within the, the, the scope of the project itself. It's like, you know, get on this or we're going to have to find someone else to do it. That's, that's a fundamental that's sort of management 101. How to get your people to do the work they're supposed to do in the time that they actually have to do it. Uh, the pressure here is more like the story I already told you at Pages where they were looking at sort of a carrot stick approach for us to ship. Uh, and we were, we were already all working 70 to 80 hours a week, and, and uh, my sister, one of the software engineers, stopped me in the hallway and said, don't they, don't they realize you're dealing with grown-ups? We were all working our butts off, and had been, for a couple of years. Uh, so it wasn't our effort that was the issue. That's something different from someone who hides out and just doesn't do their work. And then, then you have a very difficult management position. Do you pull it away from that person? Can you pull it away from that person? Can you reassign it? Uh, these are extremely difficult decisions that, uh, that have to be made as far as what's going to take to actually get the thing done on a deadline if you have someone who is not doing the work that she or he is supposed to do. So I don't envy you that problem. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Uh, accelerate chapter three, measuring and changing culture. We've, we've already looked at the thing here. <clears throat> there are, this is a useful chart. <laughs> I've shown it to you already once, I'm showing it to you here, and it will be in my last lecture. It's a handy checklist for trying to measure the level of <coughs> organizational support you have for getting the right thing done in the right way. So you've got, in a pathological or power-oriented organization, you're not getting a lot of cooperation. Uh, people who raise issues get in trouble for raising issues. This gets back to the client crew. People are shirking responsibility. This is like the guy with the arm. Uh, connecting with other separate groups is discouraged. And when things fail, it's like we want to blame, we want to find someone to blame, and usually it's the innocent. Uh, and any attempt at novelty is crushed. So this is not the type of organization I want to work for. <laughs> but there are organizations like this out there. OK. This is sort of the, the general what you will find, some level of cooperation. Messengers aren't really neglected. They are just sort of, our messengers aren't shot. They're just sort of ignored or neglected. Uh, your responsibility is, is pretty limited. You are allowed to talk to otherwise. If there's a failure, then the right people are being blamed, but they're still being blamed. And attempts at implementing novelty tends to lead to problems. Then you have the generative or performance-oriented organization. Lots of cooperation. Messengers trained. Someone asked me to talk about the criminal climate of change. Uh, Number five, the truth. What you want to do is create an environment where upper management expects and welcomes honest reporting from the trenches. Because that's how you know how things really stand. I've already said it before. When I go in to review a troubled project, usually I'll spend the first three or four days just interviewing people, mostly in the trenches, and by the time I'm done, I can tell you exactly what's going on. Because they know. People in the trenches know. 
And then you interview a number, so you're not getting one person's particular hobby horse or you know, excusing themselves. You're, you're hearing the same thing over and over again. Uh, risks are shared. In other words, people are trying to help each other out. Bridging between groups is encouraged. Postmortems. Oh my gosh. It's amazing how many organizations don't do project postmortems for lessons learned. Uh, this is actually something you'll do here. Your last individual deliverable, number 10, is your own postmortem. You just go on to, to uh, <clears throat> learning suite and you write a little thing and say, here's what went well in my project, here's what didn't go well, here's some of the reasons I see behind it, and then you get a chance to tell me what you did and didn't like about the, the class. And I, I read all those, by the way. I change the class a little almost every semester based on feedback I get. And a novelty is implemented. If someone comes up with something that looks like it will actually solve the problem and is not a silver bullet, uh, but is an actual benefit, then that implementation is encouraged. Usually you want to do that on a pilot project, a greenfield project, something new, not an existing project, and make sure that you know how to do it and do it successfully. Any questions here? Anyone have any horror stories you want to share? Yes? Um, in your experience, are these pretty uh, exclusive, call them exclusive? No, or no you'll, you'll, you'll see a spectrum for each of these. You're going to see a spectrum, and, and they can be shifted. You can have ones where a manager doesn't want to hear bad news, but down in the trenches you have a lot of good stuff going on. Uh, or vice versa. The management is actually trying to make things work, and they're dealing with issues like this down in the trenches. So no, they, it's, it's not this clear cut, but this is... This is a handy guideline to say which, which of these is it most like. Uh, elements of good information. This is good to remember. Useful information should provide answers, should be timely. In other words, you, it's, it's in time to actually make a difference and present it so it can be understood and used. Now, that sounds obvious. But you'd be surprised how much information within an organization often, often fails to meet one or more of those criteria. Uh, in other words, you find out that something was going wrong, but you only find out about it after the project has failed. And it's kind of like, oh, why didn't someone say something? Well, we were all afraid. We were going to get yelled at. And then you get yelled at for not doing it. Uh, the Webster article, we'll get through these and we'll, we'll take our... Actually, I'll probably call roll before the biology break. Well, I have you as a captive audience. Uh, getting technology lifestyles in sync. Uh, one of the Webster articles. These are some of the ways in which technology that you depend upon comes and goes. Firefly, how many of you have heard of some nifty new technology, language, IEE, environment, whatever, that sounds like it's going to be great, and you're waiting for it to use it, and you're waiting for it, and it slips, and it slips, and then it finally just goes away? Have you been through that experience? Yeah, maybe. Apple's charging pad is just a charging pad. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. Stuff, stuff that's, that's announced and you're just waiting for it, this is going to solve a problem and vanishes. This happens, this happens more often than you might think. A lot of Firefly technology just never goes anywhere. <coughs> Underdone. How many of you have used a one over release of some new technology or product and found that it's just not worth the pain? Yes? Fallout 76. I'm sorry? Fallout 76. Oh, Fallout 76. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're still trying to fix that one, aren't they? Uh, <clears throat> conveyor belt is the situation where you have a release and it's out there and it's useful, but you've got an end of life to it. Uh, there is an amazing number of millions of PCs out there that are still running Windows XP uh, because it's stable and it works. I, I amuse myself. Uh, I'll go into places where they've got point of sale systems. And I'll always look to see if there's a screen that pops up at the actual window screen. And it's like, yeah, yeah, they're running, still running XP there. <laughs> they haven't upgraded yet. Uh, and then landfill is stuff that's dead on arrival. Uh, one of the classic cases here 
uh, back, and we're, we're talking, we're talking back probably when your parents were kids. Back in the 80s, IBM came out with the IBM PC, but Apple pretty much had the home market, so Apple, Apple decided they wanted to go to the, the home market. And so they built this computer called the IBM PC Junior, which was such a flop that, that units ended up literally getting buried in, in landfills. Uh, it had an awful keyboard, it was underpowered, it was underfunctioned, could not compete with the Apple. They had the Apple, the Atari, the Amiga were all out, and it was far, far inferior to any of those. Uh, and it was, it was a, a great club. <clears throat> any questions on these? This is often an issue, by the way, in corporate and government IT, because there you tend to have technologies get, get adopted and stick around for decades. The FAA is still using vacuum tube driven mainframes to help run some of its systems. <laughs> they have, the FAA has tried two or three times to do a whole scale technology upgrade to their, their IT, and all of them have ended with some degree of failure. They, they've upgraded some systems, but they still have some incredibly archaic systems. The IRS too. IRS has spent billions of dollars in upgrading systems <coughs> and has failed a lot of those efforts. Any questions, comments? Anyone? Anyone? The arc of, oh yes. Well, I was just thinking about that. What if your uh, vacuum tube system can handle the, the workload? Like how long, like one of Well, where do you buy vacuum tubes? Yeah. Who's manufacturing them? The, the, the manufacturer of the mainframes no longer exists. How do you repair your hardware when it starts to age and overheat and components fail? Say you have, if you've got something that's like written in C though, and it's not running on... Oh, C is fine. ...hardware that's going to break, but it's old code. Um, how long, I mean, what if you have code that theoretically could stick around? Is that going to be a problem in 20 years? Or? It's only going to be a problem if there is a reason to replace it. Uh, Tony Gibson, who I worked for at OSG, one of his first programming jobs, I think this was back in the 70s, was a uh, computer that basically ran a train uh, rail yard and allowed them to, to you know, shuffle trains between different tracks and divert them in different directions. And his code ran without modification and interruption for like 30 years there. For all I know, they may still be using it. Uh, so no, there, there, there's code that will do what it's doing and is fine, but there are systems that where you, you lose the ability, you literally no longer have the source code. Uh, you no longer have the tools necessary to build it. And so if anything has to change, you're starting from scratch. You are having to rebuild it from scratch. Now, this is something we've already made reference to. I call it the arc of engineering. Now, you start developing a system. Somewhere around here, usually, it gets released. You continue to add features, and then you start getting this gradual decline because as you continue to add features and fix bugs, you, the software edge creator or software rot sets in. Uh, we've already talked about this out of the drugs. Uh, you know, the market shifts, the, you have increasingly uh, leveraged functionality added upon it. Uh, interfaces, you know, the, operating, the underlying and operating system change. A lot of software the reason why you still have you know, millions and millions of systems out there running Windows XP is typically they're running custom software or even off-the-shelf software that requires Windows XP, has not been upgraded <coughs> for Windows 7, Windows 10, or whatever. And in some cases, they don't have the source code to upgrade it, or the company that built the original software went out of business. And so the company is just continuing to push this for as long as they can until they actually have to fix things. The year 2000 problem was, was a big godsend to the IT industry because it allowed, and in some cases forced, a lot of organizations to get rid of archaic systems. That it was easier simply to replace, replace the operating system, replace the software, rebuild, rewrite things, than to try and patch it for Y2K stuff. Uh, any questions or issues here? Like I said, I assume you actually read these, so. 
Uh, Microsoft Windows Forever, I'm particularly proud of this article. Uh, this is what I published back in 1996, so we're talking 24 years ago. And in it I wrote, Windows may still be dominant in 2025. What year is it, folks? 2020. Guess what the dominant operating system on personal computers is? Windows, 24 years later. That's, that's probably the single best technical prediction I have made in my entire professional career. Uh, and it said it may look and work a bit differently, but the principles will be the same. Uh, our grandchildren will wonder about the quaint relics of terminology. <laughs> Any of you had grandkids wonder about <coughs> disc icons? It's like, what's, what's, that, what's that funny disc icon? What does that mean? Uh, the same way we talk about glove compartments in cars. How many of you have gloves in glove compartments? Yeah, actually, why is that? <laughs> but, but you will see. You will see the actual inheritance from those. How many of you? How many of you still use command windows from time to time? Okay, now we're talking about CPM and MS DOS, which I was programming in, you know, back in the '80s. Uh, it's still there. This is. Uh, I didn't update this because it hasn't changed that much, but this is personal computer. It's based on browser use. Personal computer, desktop, share. That's Windows. This is everything else. Now, there is a slight downward trend on Windows, you can see that, and if I updated this, I probably should have did, but I didn't. Uh, it would still be declining some, but it's, this is the 80% line. Uh, Windows is not going away anytime soon. Uh, and part of the issue here is that technology, successful technology, tends to entrench itself, and it's hard to displace it. The best way to displace the entrenched technology is to come up with a solution that allows you to continue to use the existing technology. And this is exactly what's happened with mobile devices. The advent of the smartphone and the smart tablet uh, is a neat sidestep because how many, how many of you have a smartphone and smart tablet and a laptop and a desktop system? Okay. You don't have to choose between the two. Now the question is, how much do you use of one or the other? Uh, I use my laptop more than I use my smartphone, and I actually don't use my iPad all that much. My wife lives on her iPad. She has she has a, a you know fairly nice late model MacBook laptop, which she does use, and she's really tickled because since we moved, I, I, we ended up with an extra 55 inch TV, and she uses that as her second one, or it's actually a duplicate monitor. So she sits in her office at home and has this 55 inch monitor for a laptop. She's really tickled with that. Uh, but she still spends, I would say, on a, at least a five or six to one basis more time on her iPad than her laptop. And I'm probably the other way around, all things considered. I spend vastly more time on my laptop occasionally than my desktop. Uh, this is something you'll run into. It's something to keep in mind. It's the same thing that happened, and I think I've already mentioned this with vinyl records and CDs. When CDs first came out, and I, I remember when CDs came out, uh, and you cost $500 for a little CD player and so on, you didn't have to give up your vinyl records to buy CDs. You just bought CDs for what you wanted to, and you still had all your record collection. So it wasn't, you didn't have to make a choice between one or the other. Uh, where you have difficulty in market penetration is where you're forcing the user to give up her or his existing solution to use yours. You better be very superior because people hate change. Uh, it's bad enough when you, you know, you get an upgrade from Apple or Windows or whatever. It's like, why did they change that? It worked just fine before. Uh, so you want, want a side-by-side -side slipstream approach. And that's the end of that lecture. Let me take roll real quick. We'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll talk about software quality assurance. Any questions before I take roll? Everyone's like, no, let's take a break. Okay.